This is Optimal Health Daily, episode 102. Exactly how to figure out what diet is right for you. Part two, by Ben Greenfield of bengreenfieldfitness.com. Get ready to maximize your potential with Optimal Health Daily, the podcast that brings you the best content in health, fitness, and nutrition five days a week. Your optimal life awaits. Now here's your host, Dr. Neil Malik. Hello, welcome back to Optimal Health Daily, or welcome for the first time if you're new here. This is the podcast where I read to you from some of the most popular health and fitness blogs online. And as always, I'm Dr. Neil, your very own personal narrator. Today's post from Ben Greenfield is actually a continuation from yesterday's reading. So if you're new here, you'll probably want to hear yesterday's episode first. That's episode 101. So let's jump right in and help you start optimizing your life. Exactly How to Figure Out What Diet is Right for You, Part 2, by Ben Greenfield of bengreenfieldfitness.com. So what can we take away from that? Along with bolstering the idea that many different diets can support health, those traditional cuisines all had a few things in common, pockets of overlap we'd best pay attention to. In each case, those health-promoting traditional diets, one, contained a rich source of fat-soluble vitamins, particularly vitamins K2, A, and D, whether from organ meats, high-quality dairy, fish, eggs, other seafood, or even insects. Two, were free from vegetable oils, white sugar, white flour, and canned foods. Three, placed muscle meats pretty low on the totem pole, valuing instead on animals' organs, skin, bones, and cartilage. And four, contained a mix of both plant and animal foods, with no diet being entirely carnivorous or entirely vegan. Of course, while prices findings show humans can thrive on an impressive range of diets, we're still left with the glaring question. How come folks today respond in wildly different ways to the same foods and diets? Is it all in our heads? You're a special snowflake. It turns out your parents were right after all. You're special. Not in a sticking crayons up your nose way, but in an individual variation way. Although we humans all share some obvious features, two lungs, a digestive tract, an innate desire to argue on the internet, we actually have some important differences once we zoom in a bit further. And those differences become critical when we look at how our diet interacts with our genes. Amylase production. Did you know you start digesting your food before you even swallow it? True story. Your saliva is teeming with proteins that kick off the digestive process, including amylase, an enzyme that breaks down starch into sugar. It's coded by a gene called AMY1. Here's where it gets interesting. The more AMY1 copies you carry, the more amylase you pump out in your saliva. In fact, depending on your genes, the amylase in your mouth can range from barely detectable to a whopping 50% of your saliva's total protein. And for each person's ability to handle starchy foods, that spells mega variation. Studies show that when low amylase producers consume starch, their blood sugar surges far higher and stays hiked for much longer than many high amylase producers eating the exact same thing. In other words, the more AMY1 copies you've inherited and the more of this enzyme you produce as a result, the better your starch metabolizing capabilities will be. And where you land on the amylase spectrum isn't just luck of the draw. Folks from traditionally starch-centric populations, like the Japanese or the Hazda of Tanzania, tend to carry more copies of AMY1 than folks from starch-scant populations, like Siberian pastoralists or hunter-gatherers from the Congo rainforest. The reason? Selective pressure. Producing more amylase was a boon for populations relying on starchy foods, so over time, survival of the fittest style, more AMY1 copies came to dominate their gene pools. In populations where starch was a dietary rarity, AMY1 copies tended to stay low. The diet of your ancestors, then, plays a big role in what's best for you today. For the modern health enthusiast, this is big news. While high amylase producers might fare well on a starch-based cuisine, low amylase producers eating the same diet would probably catapult headfirst into a heap of blood sugar swings and swollen fat cells. Keep that in mind next time you see your slim friend downing a bag of Ritz crackers while you seem to gain weight just sniffing the box. ApoE Phenotype ApoE is a fascinating little gene that codes apolipoprotein E, or ApoE for short, a protein involved in lipid metabolism and cholesterol transport. 
depending on what you inherited from your parents, you'll carry a combination of any two APOE variants, APOE2, APOE3, or APOE4. Recently, that last one, APOE4, has been grabbing the research spotlight due to some of its quirks, and not in a cute Zoe Deschanel sort of way. Along with having a much higher risk of Alzheimer's disease, APOE4 carriers tend to react to high saturated fat diets with a rise, sometimes scary high, in LDL cholesterol. Alas, we still need a great deal more research to fully understand the interaction between diet and APOE status. But in the meantime, APOE4 is a big clue why some people see their LDL spike after adopting a paleo or low-carb diet, even when their friends might boast a lovely lipid profile eating steak galore. Vitamin A Conversion Ever wonder why some people seem to rapidly self-destruct on vegetarian and vegan diets, while others ride off into the sunset with nary a complaint? Part of the reason involves vitamin A conversion, or lack thereof, as the case may be. Contrary to popular belief, plant foods like carrots don't contain any vitamin A. They contain precursors, particularly beta-carotene, that your body has to transform into a usable form of the vitamin. Animal foods are the only sources of vitamin A in its preformed state. The problem? While some folks can convert enough vitamin A from plant foods to meet their needs, others are genetically doomed to fail at the job. Two common mutations on the BCMO1 gene, which helps govern the beta-carotene to vitamin A conversion process, make it nearly impossible to get enough vitamin A from the plant kingdom alone. And if those mutation-carrying folks decide to go veggie, slashing vitamin A intake and relying on beta-carotene instead, the results aren't pretty. Infertility, plummeting immune function, skin problems, vision problems, hair loss, bone loss, brittle nails, and increased susceptibility to infection can all follow on the heels of vitamin A deficiency. And not surprisingly, those are all common complaints among those who failed on vegan or vegetarian diets. Wrapping it up. The next time you see someone pushing the one-size-fits-all diet idea, feel free to admire their chutzpah while swiftly running for the hills. As seductive as simple solutions and blanket prescriptions can be, that dietary holy grail quest will always be fruitless. Don't fall under its spell. Though it might seem frustrating, our diversity is actually pretty empowering. Honoring each other's differences can help dissolve the tribalism so prevalent in the health world, that tendency to feel threatened when someone does well in a diet other than our own, to peg those outside of our favored community as enemies instead of looking for common ground. By understanding how we each differ, we can start working hand-in-hand rather than head-to-head. Success isn't a finite resource, especially where diet is concerned. You just listened to part two of the post titled Exactly How to Figure Out What Diet is Right for You by Ben Greenfield of bengreenfieldfitness.com. Now, basically what Ben has been alluding to in these last two posts is something called nutrigenomics. Basically, how nutrition can change our genes and how our genes can change how we metabolize nutrition, or basically, how we metabolize food. This is a newer field of research, and it's fascinating. Ben is right in that it might partly explain why there are these differences when one person follows a diet and another follows the exact same one but has no success with it. I'll give you another example. A recent study was published that looked at those from the East. And they found that those that lived near India, Pakistan, China, Mongolia, that region, weren't able to process red meat as well as those from, let's say, Northern Ireland, or the UK in general, or Sweden. What they found is when those from the East consumed red meat, beef, lamb, game, those kinds of foods, pork, it increased their inflammation in the body. However, when those from Northwestern Europe consume red meat, their body didn't have that same systemic inflammatory response, which means their health risk from consuming red meat was much, much lower. So again, this goes back to the idea of nutrigenomics. It's kind of a new field of research, and we don't have all the answers yet. So if you want to go out and get your genes tested for like lots of APOE4, I wouldn't spend your money on that right now possibly insurance won't cover it anyways, and so you'll end up paying a lot out of pocket. Plus, we still have to do a lot more research on how nutrition and those genes really interact. So basically, the takeaway is, as Ben said, don't feel badly if somebody seems to be doing better than you on a certain diet. 
It just means you may need to find one that you can stick to over the long term. That's really the key. Can you follow your meal plan for long periods of time? Is it generally balanced? Then you're probably gonna be just fine. Now, before we end for the day, if you'd like to go above and beyond to help us out, a really simple and free thing you can do right now is to simply show someone how to subscribe to the podcast. It could be a friend, a family member, a coworker, anyone. You can show them on their smartphone or you can direct them to our website, oldpodcast.com. If everyone subscribed just one person, it would be a huge help. I thank you in advance for sharing this show with someone. I thank you for listening. I'm gonna leave it at that. I hope you're having a great week so far and I'll see you on tomorrow's show where your optimal life awaits. Hello, Life Optimizer. This is Justin Mollick, creator and producer of this show and Optimal Living Daily, the brother podcast of this one. Literally, I'm Dr. Neil's brother. If you like the format of this show, you'll love Optimal Living Daily too, where I also read to you from blogs, but cover other topics like personal development, finance, and minimalism from bloggers like Derek Sivers, The Minimalists, Zen Habits, and many more. So for more amazing content read to you for free, come subscribe to Optimal Living Daily too, and together we'll optimize your life. You've been listening to Optimal Health Daily. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on each new episode and head to oldpodcast.com. That's oldpodcast.com for a free gift as well as more actionable tips and resources to help you maximize your potential. Thanks for joining us and remember, your optimal life awaits.